Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're going to take a look at this little tiny thing right here, which is the ASUS PN51S1. Now, that is a whole bunch of gobbledygook, which really doesn't mean that much, other than that's the model name. But what this is, is an 8-core, 16-thread mini desktop PC. I mean, this thing is absolutely tiny. You almost want to like hold it with like a pinky up or something like that. It's so small. And yet, inside this, not only do we have the 8-core, 16-thread processor, we also have 32 gigs of RAM and 8 terabyte NVMe SSD, and we haven't even maxed this thing out. Now, for a long time, we've been doing our Project Tiny Mini Micro series. And with that, we've been looking at the mini PCs or the one liter PCs from Lenovo, HP, and Dell. And they're about this big. This is the, uh, you know, a Dell Optiplex one liter PC. And it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good size. Now, just giving you some sense of like how much smaller this thing is, you can actually see that this is uh, wildly smaller than the Dell platform, one liter PC platform. This processor is only a 15 watt TDP processor, which means that this actually uses a lot less power than the one liter PCs that we've looked at, especially as power prices have crept up, especially in 2022. You know, folks have asked, well, Patrick, what can we do in terms of lower power consumption? And that's really what I want to look at here. I also want to just talk about what you give up in terms of performance and what you can still do in a small platform like that. So the game plan, as always, is we're going to go take a look at the hardware, both the external hardware overview, and then we're going to get inside the system. I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to show you what we did to actually go from a bare bones to a fully functioning system actually very easily. And then what we'll do is we'll look at performance, power consumption, we'll show you the noise and we'll actually let you hear that. And then we're gonna get to our key lessons learned. Now, all of this is gonna be in the description. So if you wanna go, you know, click ahead and go skip ahead to a different section, you can totally go do that. But with that, let's get on to the hardware overview. So first off, let's talk about the dimensions of this little thing. Now, this is a, I think, 115 millimeter by 115 millimeter by I think like 49 millimeter uh, tall. So this is not actually a huge platform by any means. And for those of us still using inches, it's about four and a half by four and a half inches, and then about 1.9 to two inches tall. So, I mean, this thing is absolutely tiny and you can definitely put it in a lot of different places. The system did come with this handy little mount. And so if you want to go mount it somewhere, you totally can, but we're not going to talk about that too much. Other than I'm just going to show you, it did come with one. Looking on the front of the system, we see a couple of key features that are pretty common in this class of device. You're gonna first see that we have a headset jack, so that's kind of our first feature. Then we also have two USB ports. The first one is a Type-A port. The second one is a Type-C port. Now, both of these USB ports are USB 3.2 Gen 1, which means that they're only five gigabit per second ports. That's a total bummer, and all of the USB ports on the system are Gen 1, not Gen 2. So we just wanna kind of get that out there. The other features that you're gonna see is that we actually have like the power power button and status LEDs. Those are just kind of the features that you're gonna see on the front. And this is a small system. So a lot of times this is gonna be tucked away somewhere. You're not gonna see it anyway, but there is some stuff here. Now getting to the back of the system, we have a lot more going on. So let's talk about the, I guess, easy one first. The first thing that we actually have on one side is we have a DC input. We'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the section, but this is actually the power brick. This power brick is a 90 watt and it's I think a 19 and a half volt power supply. And this actually doesn't use that much power. So if you really, really wanted to and maybe you weren't running like a maxed out configuration, I think you can actually probably find a PoE splitter and actually go run this on PoE++. So if you're just kind of like, I want everything on PoE, you could actually run this desktop most likely on that. But let's be clear, this does not have PoE in, which is a bummer. And next to that, we have our two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports. Again, Gen 1, bummer, but that's what we have. Now, looking at the other side, we have a total of three display outputs, but one of them is kind of disguised. So we have our HDMI 1.4 port. We also have display port. Now the display port uh, came with our unit, but apparently this is something that you can configure. So I guess like if you're ordering maybe a lot of these things for your business or something like that, maybe you can configure that. I don't exactly know how that works, but you can see it is a configurable slot. That is very similar to a lot of the one liter PCs that we see in the corporate desktop area. Now the third display output though is really interesting. So this is a USB port and it actually says 10. So it says that it's a gen two port, but um, the official spec is that it's only a gen one port. So I don't know if like this is like what we got versus like what's supposed to be shipping. I don't exactly know. But the other side to it is that this little thing also has a couple of other features. Like for example, it has the display output. So you can actually get a, you know, USB type C to a display port output or something like that. And you can actually have a third display on this little system, which is actually really cool that you can drive three displays on something that's, you know, this tiny. And then in the middle, you're gonna see that we have a RJ45 port. Now, some people online are actually out there saying that this is a one gigabit per second port, which I think is kind of interesting.
interesting because in our unit, we actually got a two and a half gig ethernet port and uh, it's actually a Realtek uh, RTL 8125, I think, uh, port. And you'll see that in Ubuntu and also Windows that we actually have the two and a half gig ethernet adapter. So just in terms of wired networking, you do get two and a half gig ethernet in this, which I really like in a little platform, especially these days. A lot of the kind of one liter desktop PCs from HP, Lenovo and Dell, those things are still on one gig. And uh, this just kind of feels a little bit more modern because we do have two and a half gig ethernet. We are doing a ton of content on two and a half gig ethernet, including switches. We're doing PoE switches. We're doing routers and firewalls. We're doing a lot of two and a half gig ethernet content just because I think that it is an upgrade and it's time to upgrade the infrastructure. So I really like the fact that Asus has that here. Now on the size of the system, there's really not that much. You can see that we have some venting on either side, but that's all that there really is. Now on the bottom of the system, that's actually a little bit more interesting. It came with these little rubber feet, which I really like when these things have rubber feet and you have to apply them yourself. I just kind of really like that. You also have some of the mounting holes for the options. So if you, you don't want to go use that mounting bracket that I showed you earlier, you can totally go do that here. You also have some vents here and then, you know, all of our regulatory stuff, but you know, frankly, there's really not that much going on on the bottom of this either, except for the fact that we can actually see the instructions on how to go and get this system set up. Because we got a bare bone system, we actually have to go and remove the four screws. Now I've already done that, just so hopefully I can show you how to open this. And just so you know, this is not the, I guess, most graceful opening process. I've probably opened the system, I don't know, eight to 10 times at this point, and I've definitely done it not gracefully, but we're gonna try that right now. Oh, actually that time it worked really well. Hmm. Anyway, uh, you just kind of slide this little thing out. And then when you slide this out, you get your in, you know internal view of the system. Now that sliding action is actually really interesting too. And we don't have one in here, but you can actually put a two and a half inch SATA SSD or hard drive. And you can put that here on this lid and then it slides into place because you can actually see that we have a connector right here, which is our two and a half inch connector. And so with this two and a half inch connector, you can have your SSD, your hard drive and go connect it in there. And I actually think that the Asus solution here is pretty darn innovative. Now below that two and a half inch SATA connector, you can see that we have an M.2 SSD installed. Now we're gonna show you a photo where you can see what's below that. And if you see there, you have your Intel AX200, which is a Wi-Fi 6 solution. And so you have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in this system. And then the real feature though, is the fact that there is an M.2 uh, connector there, and then you can go put an NVMe SSD. Now this is only a PCIe Gen 3 system. So um, a couple things there. One, it keeps the heat down or I guess heat generation down because the PCIe Gen 3 SSDs tend to be a little bit cooler than their newer, you know, higher power Gen 4 counterparts. So that's kind of beneficial. And the other side to it is that you just don't need to go and spend the money to go get a super fast SSD. Now, if you just care about storage performance, this is probably not the right system for you. But on the other hand, if you just need capacity, that's what we're gonna show you here. And that's why we have this Sabrin or Sabrin eight terabyte Rocket Q SSD. Now below that SSD, you're gonna see that we have two SO DIMMs. Now these are DDR4 SO DIMMs and you'll see that we actually have two 16 gigabyte Sabrin DDR4 3200 SO DIMMs here. And the reason if you're wondering why we have all Sabrin stuff is because William Harmon, who used to, you know, we'll just give him a shout out. He used to be and do all of our SSD and a lot of our GPU reviews. He now does marketing at Sabrin. And so he sent us these to go and uh, throw in this little system. So thank you, William, if you're watching this, just kind of, and thank you Sabrin for sending these so that way we actually had something to put in because we purchased this as a bare bones. That bare bones though was something that I'm kind of mixed about and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Overall though, this is a really functional interior. Now what you're gonna notice is that we don't see the CPU. The CPU is actually on the other side with all the cooling for it. And this is a 15 watt CPU. So this is the AMD Ryzen 7 5700U. And that U of course means that we have a 15 watt TDP processor. And the 15 watt TDP means that this is kind of more of like something like you'd see in a notebook or something like that. So this is a fairly low power processor. But even though this is a relatively low power processor, it also is an eight core 16 thread processor. So we get some pretty decent performance. And so that's, I think what we're gonna go look at next. Now, taking a look real quick at the performance of the 5700U, you're gonna see that the overall performance is good. Now, there is a, another system that we are gonna be looking at from another vendor, which has the 5800U, so we actually already have that in these results. But the key thing that I really want you to notice here is just by having eight cores and 16 threads, even though we don't get the you know full turbo clocks that we get on some of the other systems, and you know we do have to sacrifice some clock speed, which means we do lose performance, which you can see in the results. But the big thing here is that we're 
we're also shedding a lot of power consumption. So it turns out, and the reason for this, if a lot of folks don't know this, but if you actually have you know a silicon die, right? And you go and you put, and you wanna hit higher clock speeds, a lot of times that means that you put voltage in there. A lot of overclockers did that for you know long, many, many years. You'd go increase the voltage and that gives you a little bit more clock speed headroom on silicon. But it turns out when you do that, it's not necessarily super efficient to go and hit a lot of the higher clock speeds. So if you take an architecture and you run it at lower voltages, you can get a large amount of the performance that you would get at the higher voltages. You can get that just by having a lot of cores and being able to run them at decent clocks, but you're sacrificing that top end to get much lower power consumption. That's a super simplified version of that, but the overall performance is pretty good. The 5800U is a little bit faster, but it's not necessarily something that to me, I would say like, you know, oh, if, if I need to get the 5800U or anything like that. I, it just, to me, I think that those, those chips are actually pretty darn close and it is pretty competitive with a lot of the eight core, both AMD and Intel systems. So I, I think that this is good. It's not necessarily as fast as some of the other ones that we've seen, but it's still a decent level of performance, especially in this power envelope. I also do wanna note real quick that this is really kind of like the high end of this. And so this is one of the more expensive units, but it's also, uh, I just kind of wanted the fast one because you know, why not get the fast one? But on the flip side, if you look at what you can get in a system like this, there are other options that have fewer cores. Like you can get a, like a 5500U or other, other lower end options. And so Asus actually has a number of different options. So if you don't really need this much performance and you just need something that just do like web browsing or something like that, you probably don't need eight cores and it may be beneficial to just get fewer cores. And so I'm just gonna leave it there that those are also less expensive. If you wanna get them, you can go look those up, but we only have this one. Now, in terms of power consumption, this thing did absolutely stunningly. Now, the configuration that I showed you was really more of a higher end configuration, right? We had 32 gigs of memory. You can go up to, I think, like 64 maximum in the system. And we also had a total of, you know, the eight terabyte SSD. But overall though, we were like under 30 watts in terms of our overall power consumption at default settings, which I thought was pretty darn good. At idle, we were just under 10 watts. Now, the configuration that we have, we were just a little bit over. So so we we're, I think like 10 to 11 watts of power consumption. So it's just definitely a little bit higher, but it's not necessarily, I think something that um, is like crazy in terms of power consumption. It's actually in line with something like we would see in that one liter PC segment with like a Core i5 6500T or something like that. We just get a lot more performance, even though we're in that same you know power envelope. Now, SDH is now based in Texas and power here is still relatively inexpensive, but in Europe, for example, you're starting to see things like every watt that you save on a system can be like, I don't know, two, three dollars a year. And so, you know, if you're saving 30, 40 watts here and there on a little system like this, I mean, that's actually pretty amazing amounts of dollar savings or euro savings or pound savings, whatever. So while the system cost could be a little bit higher, also just keep you know the running costs in mind because that kind of really impacts you know, how much you're really gonna end up spending. Okay, so it's time for some noise testing, I guess, which is our uh, flip side to this. So we're gonna actually just go and I'm gonna put this up here just so you can kind of hear this thing. This is actually booting up right now and I'm gonna be quiet so you can just kind of hear it. I mean, this thing is pretty darn quiet, guys. Like, I can barely hear it. I can hear a little, a little fan noise from here, but it's, it's really just not that much. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna go run a little, uh, just like Geekbench, just kind of let you listen to that. Okay, if you just heard that little ramp, that's just running the single-threaded workloads right there. Okay, you probably heard that ramp right there. And that's really just that we have now hit about a minute or so of running Geekbench. And so it's definitely getting a little bit louder. Okay, now we're in the multi-threaded. You heard it ramp again there. Now we're getting about two minutes in. You heard another ramp. We're just finishing up. Here's the noise. And yeah, Windows was being a little bit funky with their firewall. So we have a wired connection in case anybody's wondering, hopefully hiding that with the blue background. But anyway, the whole idea here is that this thing is not crazy loud by any means, especially if you're just kind of doing like looking at things in Chrome or just kind of, you know, using kind of web apps or something like that. It's really not that bad at all. It's not completely silent. So I don't want to get anybody to think like, oh, this is a totally silent unit. But again, because this is such a low power unit, the overall noise is actually really good. It's way better than I thought it was going to be. 
Now, with all of these little tiny units, we always do a section on key lessons learned. And I think with this system, there are a couple things that were definitely noticeable. So the first thing is that the hardware compatibility list only has Windows. And on some of the things like you see like Amazon and stuff like that, it says like, you know, Windows 10 or Windows 11 Pro on some of the listings. And you might be like, well, that means that this comes with Windows 10 or Windows 11 Pro, right? Well, the answer is that our system did not. And then when I installed Windows 11, I said, hey, you know, let's get all the way through. And I just kind of looked if it would see a BIOS key because a lot of the OEM systems have like BIOS keys for Windows 11, Windows 11 Pro, and we did not have one. So that was, you know, frankly, just a little bit of a bummer. On the flip side, if you want to run Linux, well, there aren't any, actually any Linux operating systems that are in the hardware compatibility list. Luckily though, because this is just a Realtek NIC and an Intel AX200 NIC and, you know, a Ryzen based system that's very similar to like a laptop type platform. This thing works no problem in Ubuntu. So if you do want to go run, you know, like a, a server on this and have like, like, you know, a Debian based server, absolutely, you can totally go do it on this thing. On the flip side, if you do want to go and buy a Windows license, you're probably going to have to factor that into the overall cost. Now, let's talk about the cost for a second, because I think that's also kind of interesting. We got this unit for, I think it was like $529. And that was like good, you know, probably $140, $150 more than the 5500U Ryzen system. And, you know, to me, that was a lot more. But on the other hand, I was like, well, I kind of want the faster one. So that's why we spent the extra money. On the flip side, that is quite expensive, actually. I mean, this did not come with a Windows license. So if you do want that, you're gonna have to pay for it. If you want something like, you know, to actually have maybe SSDs and, and you know, memory or anything like that, you're gonna have to add that as well. And so this system fully configured is gonna probably cost you, I mean, you're probably gonna spend at minimum maybe $700 or so for a decently configured system. And so I just kind of want to make sure that everybody knows that in terms of pricing, I don't think that these things are necessarily cheap. On the flip side though, I actually do really like the fact that, you know, it's kind of in that range that you would see on some of the tiny mini micro systems. It's super easy to service. And overall, I do really like the platform, even though it's not the cheapest. Now, people, if you do want to go build a bigger giant gaming PC, giant workstation, you can totally go do that. And you could probably do it maybe for less than this. You can get more performance. But guys, this is so small. I mean, this is tiny. And I think that's really the benefit of this. You also don't have to go pick out cases. You don't have to pick out motherboard, any of that kind of stuff. It's super easy to get into. Couple other little things though. I did notice that the BIOS uh, was probably not the most fully featured and just want to just kind of show you. So we'll have some screenshots just kind of running through that. It was okay. But on the other hand, it definitely was a lot lighter than we see in, you know, kind of like a Asus desktop, you know, consumer system. You're definitely, or even the CSM model that we looked at recently uh, in another piece, this is definitely a different type of BIOS. So you just kind of do definitely notice that. And the other thing that's kind of obvious whenever you go run this thing is just the fact that this is a plastic case. This is not a metal case. You can kind of hear it. And that's just kind of what it is. Um, you know, this is really meant to be probably like an Intel NUC type of alternative. And so it's kind of targeting that segment. But the flip side is that this thing is super light. So mounting it, I mean, I could definitely see just putting some Velcro here, just sticking it or basically wherever, because this thing is not heavy by any means. I mean, this is this is super light compared to like that Dell Optiplex that I had earlier. This is uh, way, way lighter. So there, there is, you know, a trade-off here, but it does definitely, you know, it looks okay. And it's a little bit of a fingerprint magnet, but it is definitely a plastic chassis, which is kind of a bummer. It would have been nice if it was metal. Of course, the benefit is that if you do have a light chassis that you can hang anywhere, the fact that this makes a little bit of fan noise, you can go throw this out of the way and you're probably not going to hear it in most ambient environments unless you have something like, you know, you have a perfectly quiet studio for like editing music or something like that. Maybe this is too loud, but we did also, that was done with the just kind of normal fan settings. It was not, there's another quiet mode in the BIOS that we didn't use. So maybe you get a little quieter, but it's pretty darn quiet to me. Hey guys, I hope you liked this look at the Asus PN51S1. I think this system is absolutely cool and I hope you enjoyed this look at it. I know we've had a lot of requests for these little Asus systems and so this is our first one. We are going to have a couple others in our STH mini PC series. Also in the STH mini PC series, we are going to have more of those little firewalls and a whole bunch of other really kind of cool systems that we have. Uh, just we had most of the team, we had like seven folks that were out on, on the STH team in just the first part of 
part of August. So everything slowed down a little bit. I apologize guys, but everybody's coming back and I think everything's, the machine is starting to work, run in terms of making more content. So just hang with us. We're gonna have more stuff very, very soon. And hey, if you did like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with those great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.